Hi everybody, welcome to April's edition of Brands and Outliers. So much good stuff in this deck today. I'm really excited to get started, so I'll hand it over to you guys. AI has kind of really been contained to a mostly digital world. Um, you know, we have access to it through our, you know, in our phones and our devices, but we're really start about to start interacting with AI in a new way in really our built environment. So being able to explore touch with AI, AI doing physical things for us. So this section is all about uh, what touching AI will be like. So making the rounds this week uh, was a figure one demonstration that is enabled and equipped with ChatGPT. Um, we can include the link in the show notes. It's fascinating. It's only like two minutes. Like there is a, an apple on the table, some cups and those dishes, as you can see. And he talks to it just like you talk to ChatGPT and it answers just like you're, you know, talking to ChatGPT and asks it to give me some food. And it has to like scan the table and, oh, that's food, hands it to him. What do you think? You guys, where do you think the dishes should go? Um, I think they should go in the dish, dishwashing rack and it puts it away. It's a really interesting demonstration. And then the other, the other link there is a, a company that's, working on something similar. Uh, it just the point of this slide is just to show that like, we've gotten accustomed to ChatGPT, you know, in a browser or on an app, but it's soon to come into, into the, the, the real world. Um, I think I'm going to wait on getting a domestic robot until after we um, figure out that AGI is going to be okay, and it's not going to kill us. But then Rebecca and Holly pointed out that well, no, wouldn't AGI want you to think it's not going to kill you so that you adopt it and then get it? So I don't know, when would you guys get uh, a domestic robot? Are you going to be early adopters on that? Or is that going to be something that, uh, you know, you wait on? My thing was that I feel like I just won't have a choice but to get it. It's sort of like at some point everyone's going to have one. I think I'll just wait when that happens. <laughs> I, uh, I might not be an early adopter. I think food is going to be one of the big use cases here. If like when it can start cooking you really good food, like when it starts to become like a private chef, um that's a pretty killer use case in a lot of ways um so that's that's kind of my hunch and i think that the kind of the deeper point here is just that like we're pretty much at that turning point now where it's like we've sort of solved visual and spatial intelligence and so that's obviously just what this starts to look and feel like is that you talk to it like you talk to a person i'd be pretty sold if it could start uh folding my laundry and putting it away so <laughs> here on the left a whole rash of new things that could scare people uh, this newsletter, though, is about optimistic futures. And it's like, wait, this doesn't have to be so bad. Like for every negative trend or I mean, every negative interpretation, there can be a positive spin on that interpretation. So, yeah, figure one, we just talked about that. Um, uh, Devin, the uh, autonomous coding robot that was getting a, a lot of the news this last last month. Klarna, like with its customer service chatbot, um, basically does the job extremely well. Um, and so yeah, you get the idea, but like, there's a, a pretty famous book, like, you know, about 10, 10 years ago, David Graeber bullshit jobs. And it's like, well, you know, we don't like these jobs anyway. So like, it's fine if they're automated, like nobody wants to do them and the people that are doing them aren't happy. So, you know, perhaps more human connection can come out of that. And we're already seeing in all the literature on what AI in the workplace does it enables you to use your imagination and your imagination to take off. So if we're less skill constrained, we can be more imagination constrained. There was a feature here in this newsletter too on number three, uh, a restaurant that actually just needs three human beings to be there at all times and then the rest is automated. Well, those workers make a lot more money than if they were working a, you know, a fully staffed human restaurant. There's just more, there's more profit, there's more wages to go around to, to, to people. And if AI is going to lower the price of things, of, of the production of goods as it, as it will, well, then you can reach bigger markets. Suddenly, innovations aren't so, you know, cloistered. They can be cheaper. More people can get access to them. So, you know, the future will be some mix of like both of these polls, that's for sure. But it's just worth pointing out, like, what could go right. Can I say one thing, though? Um, it just reminds me of a case study from like, I think the 70s, when the dishwasher was invented, people thought that women would be working less. Um, but what happened instead was when the dishwasher was invented, people got rid of their domestic in-home labor, like nannies and um, house cleaners, and the woman just started doing more of the house cleaning. Somehow labor moves in weird ways, like just because we take some sort of labor out of um, the workforce or our daily lives doesn't mean that we don't fill it with something else. And it's just like a weird unintended consequence. Um Something a little tangential to this, too, just to, to point out how we're so bad at um, figuring out what the future actually means. Plenty of people predicted, like, the microwave or um, 
other kinds of kitchen technology, but we never predicted the second order insight that because of those technologies, fewer people would be sitting around a table together eating food. And I think like that's why it's so important to be super creative when you think about these things, because yes, this is a logical conclusion. It's the conclusion we want, but somehow human behavior usually goes a little sideways when this kind of stuff happens, at least in the beginning. Yeah, it reminds me of your, I think, you know, you were the one that were that found it and made it its way into one of your articles that we could um, predict a cell phone, but not women in the workplace. Yeah. So what's really interesting here is the discrepancy. And the second order insight is like, we've talked about the negativity bias and the negativity economy in previous versions of outliers. I have to imagine that that's what this is capturing. Our ingoing perception of AI is that it's going to be bad. It's going to make uh, so many people unemployed. Therefore, I don't like this. This is not, this is not um, you know, impacting my productivity in a positive way. That's what we're saying here in the US, but like, look at the discrepancy in other countries. So it's like, is this a function of like ingoing mindset? Like, what is this actually capturing? That's my best interpretation, but I just wonder if anybody else has any, any other interpretations. Well, I think the first thing is, this is huge. Like, this is a massive, massive discrepancy. Um, and also, you know, it's just the ratio of 17 to 12 from improved to hindered productivity. We're near 50-50 with people saying basically that like, Eh, I don't know if this is going to hurt me or help me versus, you know, like India, where the ratio is just crazy off. So, I mean, I, I look at this and this is this is a pretty shocking stat. Part of me wonders if it's if it's something to do with how we perceive ourselves, like in the sense of like, am I is it are we are we maybe are we like a little bit in denial of like how much this is actually helping us in the sense that like I can't admit that like AI has been actually mm. helping me so therefore I can't admit that it's actually improved my productivity because then it takes the spotlight away from like my own work as like a you know a scene as something that's like I worked hard for you know um that's that's what I think about this that's I think there might be like an expectation thing too like it's possible that Americans just expect AI to be doing so much more, so it's hard for them to measure the actual impact it's having on their lives. And that could be easily a cultural thing. Yeah. But I, I do think, Rebecca, you touched on such an interesting point about my self-worth. You know, if my if my worth is my productivity, then I may be more productive, but maybe I feel less good about myself. And and so I wonder if that, like, internalized capitalism, that, that self-narrative of, you know, like, I wonder how much that's at play here. Because what would be really interesting as an accompanying stat is actually how much productivity has increased and changed and contrasted. And I wonder if that would tell a very different story in terms of like perception, awareness, and then reality and narrative. I just want more. Please more cross-country <laughs> AI research after after seeing this. It's like, this is a gold yeah. mine of interpretation. For real. Again, feeling the touch of AI. This first one is is not physical, but it Google has created a bot that will play video games with you. Obviously, people are going to use this. This is the very first step into like a network of friends that are AIs, like you can do things together suddenly and like share an experience and versus just talking. Like we know that's coming. It's going to happen in VR and, and AR for sure. But like here, let's play a game. Let's have an experience. Likewise, playing a game. This is a um, a machine that was trained on tennis. And so it understand it, it can read your movement across the net and know where to put the ball. So it's not quite there yet, but it's pretty close to being able to feel like you're playing a human. And obviously, like way better than the old fashioned, you know, ball machine that would just go like that. And so I think it's just the tip of the iceberg, right? Like get, we're going to probably see this first in games um, because there's such a, you know, proven use case there. But it's just interesting to think about all of the ways that like we're going to have stand ins for human, you know, companionship like this. So I think that low key gaming is going to be like AI is going to have such a huge impact on gaming that like. Could you imagine playing a video game and you save the town and then a bunch of kids from the town come up to you and they're so grateful for you saving them and this woman is in tears because, you know, you saved like her, her children and like, you know, like there, there is an, a deep emotional payoff. We, we get a tiny bit of that with like highly narrative games where it's like scripted and voice, you know, voice recorded. But like when it feels organic that they're actually responding to you and what you specifically chose to do in the way that you did, like, I think that's a whole different thing. Like we're... we're you know, we haven't got to like the uncanny valley of like the human interaction piece in gaming, but like, I wonder if we just skip that and we go straight to this feels emotionally fully immersive. Like this feels like an emotional simulation of a town of, of people. And I, I wonder what happens when, 
we get to do that because gaming has always been about action and combat because that's very easy to, to, to replicate. But we've never had like emotional things of what if, you know, you're just like a character in a town and there's all this drama going on and it's got no violence whatsoever, but it's emotionally intertwining. Like I, we don't have that. We've not been able to have that yet. And so I just, I, I think that like, there is a whole cinematic universe waiting to happen here. And I, I just, it, it could be profoundly addictive in, in a positive and a very negative way. Something else that I I don't think is in this deck, but I want us to keep an eye out for is like, when do religious leaders start talking about how we're supposed to interpret AI and how we're supposed to include it in our lives? Because it feels every time something has threatened to come between like humanity and the church, um, the church has something to say about it. Every church has something to say about it. And I wonder what the narrative or like yeah. the the party line is going to be about this um, and how they're going to, I don't know, you treat it like an adversary, like this invisible abstract thing, or what is the morality that they're going to bring into this conversation? Yeah. Is there a confession GPT, you know? Um, is that like, no, I mean, like we, we joke about it now, but like at some point, does that become normalized enough that like it makes it into the, the experience there? You know, like I just, it's, it's a worthwhile question because I think you're right in that like, a lot of these tools get dispersed. They get used throughout a lot of surface area. I mean, it might not be na- mainstream, but probably someone will do something like that at some point in the near future. Okay, well, Mark Wahlberg's app, whatever that's called, I forget, is doing really well. And it's reaching people who aren't even Christian. I think Zach or somebody else in the team shared that in our Slack earlier. So it's already like wedged its way in, like yeah. the platform technology has. I know it's not like an AI thing. It's just giving you... Bible verses, but somebody's going to draw a line at some point. Like you're going to start hearing sermons about like not letting your kids do whatever. And I really want to know the minute that happens. Yeah. You wonder if they're talking about smartphones now. It really feels like things like um, Hillsong that leveraged uh, music and celebrity and were hip. That was just the Trojan heart. Like I feel AI and religion are going to mix. And there actually is something in here a little bit later about um, uh, chatbots trained on the scripture that people can interact with. And so it's like, it's coming, you know, it's like yeah. the first generation, the, the ones like that exist now that, you know, maybe baby boomer preachers are going to have that message, but give it 30 years, like, right? Like, and these kids are gonna grow up with all this and like, it'll be wildly radically different. You'd have to imagine. Has to be. Yeah. It makes you think about the fact that it, when you think of, when you put scripture and like ChatGPT can like do that, then the, the need for pastors like goes away. And so it's more like, it's not almost like a threat to religion itself. It's just like a threat to pastors and like the leaders in like these positions, like spiritual leaders. So I can definitely see why like the Pope might be like, be careful. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking you'd have your own personal, you know, pastor with you, or it's like a replication of your pastor. So you're getting like real time moral advice or, you know, that type of thing. Yeah. yeah. I, I do think that like what, people see AI as a very point to point kind of like, I'll use this here and use, you know, like I'll use a, you know, pastor AI that you're talking about. you know, I think what we maybe don't imagine is having a community of AI around us where all of them just serve different functions and what it would feel like to be inside of a community that is at least 50% AI. So Elon Musk's Neuralink um, implanted the first of their chips in a person's brain. Um, this person, uh, Noah, or sorry, Noland, um, was completely quadriplegic. Um, he became that way in a diving accident, and he would be able to like use different controls with a kind of like tongue joystick. But essentially, what this has allowed him to do is play uh, one of his favorite video games by just using his mind. Um, so it's just cool and wild. Um, but so there's, you know, a couple more competitors in this BlackRock Microsystems and Synchron. So um, Neuralink's a little bit of a laggard, but now we have like three big players in the space and they're actually kind of, there's a little bit of a race for, you know, who's going to make the most innovations first. So does anyone on this call understand how that works or do we need to get Elon to explain it for us? Because I don't understand how this works at all. So I guess it was put on the part of the brain that controls movement. So um, I guess you'd have to... You know, it depends where you interact with the brain, but essentially controls movement. So he's able to move and control this game. They basically put a little grid of electromagnetic sensors essentially on a region of the brain and they detect 
neuronal activity and our, our brains are pretty quick at adapting to different things like there's a you know you used to be able to put a pad in your tongue that could um basically take camera inputs and make them sensory inputs on your tongue and relatively quickly people can essentially start to see using that the touch on their tongue so our brain kind of is able to rewire itself to some extent and so i think that quite quickly it becomes an intuitive interaction to just move a cursor around so basically it's it's it feels I, I think the gist is like near as seamless as, you know, moving your finger around. Yeah, it speaks to like the broader trend of like, we're slowly being able to shape reality with just our minds. And mm -hmm. like, I fell down a near death experience report reading rabbit hole over the last month. And like, what was common in a lot of that was that people said that like, when they're beyond, they could shift their environment and like inside and outside had no difference. It was like all I thought it and things changed. I thought it and I moved. And so like it's a parallel that I'm drawing intentionally because it feels very, you know, godlike the, the ability just yeah. to like shape your reality with your with only your thoughts like that's that's pretty crazy. That's mm -hmm. amazing. You should write a post about that. Not you know, I don't know that that's an article, but like post it somewhere. It's a very interesting connection to make. I think what 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 I'm curious about is a lot of that is output that I can change the world around me. What I'm really curious about is when we start to get input. What happens, you know, when I can plug an API into my brain and I know, you know, what the weather is tomorrow or what the stock market is doing or the sentiment analysis of, you know, the eastern United States, like what we can build new senses. I mean, at some point, theoretically, you know, we can do input as well as output. And that starts to I mean, that really starts to feel godlike. Speaking of building your environment, uh, NVIDIA has created a Latte 3D. And what this does is it's you're able to use prompts like ChatGPT and then turn those into 3D visual models. So um, this also has implications for 3D printing. So you'd able you'd be able to create a prompt and then potentially 3D print whatever you just prompted. So before it would take like an hour for AI models to do this, now it takes 10 to 13 seconds. So you can make you know digital objects, but again, like this be, could become physical objects. So you could, you know, make your own video games, make your own like items in like a digital space. But again, like those can cross over and you could actually start to potentially 3D print digital objects. We're doing our sense making in the extremes. We're at the extremes. And the section, you know, with everything that's going on in the world right now, we're noticing a lot of our norms shift in weird ways and more specifically in extremes. Call it disillusionment, nihilism, cool optimism, trauma, whatever the cause may be. It feels that we're trying to make sense of culture in a way, and it's kind of showing up in interesting and weird combinations. We uh, are in the midst of a swearing renaissance, you could call it. Uh, we're swearing in the workplace. Took all I had to hold back there. Um, we're s changing the things that we find offensive and not offensive. Uh, this the whole article center centered on the, the like the c word has been reclaimed, and like that's like suddenly like less offensive, and a lot of speculation on why. People blamed Donald Trump. People blamed social media. Um, people blamed COVID. Like, it's probably all of the above. Um, but yeah, it's just like just a time to think about the history of swear words and how like that changes through through time. And it's like, what are the swear words of the future? You know, what are like you know, p past swear words that we've just accepted? And yeah, and just... I don't know. Um, the swear words that exist now have existed my entire life. I don't think I've ever seen a new swear word come. I've only noticed when like certain swear words um, fall um, in severity. So when crap started showing up on TV everywhere, that was a, I remember being surprised by that as a kid. This makes me think of how I see in a lot of like parenting content or like, I don't know, the challenges or whatever those videos that people make about their kids. Kids are exposed to so much swearing. I don't know when that was normalized, but they swear a lot themselves too. I've seen like a, a rash of videos that, that show that. I know that there are some studies that if you're in pain, swearing reduces your pain more than if you didn't swear. And I know that if you swear more, you're likely more honest. So there, are, it feels like there's some psychological benefits to all of this. So I don't see it as a bad thing. I think also we're just not as offended by things in the same way, you know, because like society is just getting kind of more diverse in, in a way. So I wonder if if there could be words that would offend us as much, um, you know, the, the you know, in the way that swear words have operated. Yeah, I think I think you hit it with authenticity as the word of the year of 2023. <laughs> what comes with that is a lot of swearing. <laughs> right, right. Well, yeah, <laughs> makes sense in hindsight. <laughs> My thought is that with swear words, I feel like I don't know how this connects, but I feel like there's a connection somewhere in this in that we have sort of toned down a lot of like personal insult, like words that are like very insulting to the person and like created and leaned way more into 
oh, it's not you, it's the situation that I'm mad at. And so therefore, like, all the swear words come, like, or sort of related to that. Like, we're, in, you know, name-calling less, but we're swearing a lot more to sort of, like, combat that in some ways, maybe. Just, like, just thought of that right now. That's interesting. So, like, the word capitalism is functionally a swear word now? <laughs> or... I mean, I've, I've, I don't know about you guys, but I've seen it thrown around on the internet as a swear word, kind of like, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's a swear word. Likewise, making sense at the extremes, we're seeing the rise of the raunchy Christian um, for a similar, probably for similar reasons. Everything that I just said about what could be causing, you know, the rise of swearing, like, I think applies here too. Um, this author, and trying to figure this out, uh, blamed the gleefully combative talk radio of the 1990s. You know, think of Rush Limbaugh. Um, yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. And then Trump was an heir to that sort of, you know, way of being in the world. And it's become, on the right, the dominant, you know, political modality. And so, yeah, I mean, to me, it makes a lot of sense. But, like, I didn't understand this Real Women of America calendar. It was supposed to, like, be a jab at liberals. They were supposed to make liberals mad. But then a lot of conservatives got mad about it. Um yeah, I remember seeing that controversy like, you know, late last year, but that was surfaced in connection with this article, too, as another example of like the loosening mores of, of you know, of Christians. This was not I feel like it's funny because like, you know, talking about it being hard to predict the future. Never seen the sci fi do this. <laughs> so it's kind of interesting. Similar, but coming at a different angle, just to sort of add on to Zach's points, um, Haley Bieber has always been sort of folk, very vocal about being Christian. Um, but it's interesting that like how she appears on social media, her among other influencers like her or Ballerina Farm on the surface, they're like your everyday influencer. You know, they have like, you know, they show their skin, like bikini pics, lingerie, they're, they, they're selling their beauty lines and things like that. Everything that might quote unquote seem like antithetical to like a tr like really you know pinned up like traditional Christian faith, um, Haley Bieber still very very much vocal about her spirituality and her religion. Just another interesting way in which we're making sense of sort of the religion and our identities and showing that on social in the workplace. Two different reactions to the evolution like evolving nature and relationship with work. In China, um, this person went to work in just sort of like a not quote unquote professional outfit and somebody pointed out, it's like, that's gross. And then po posted on Chinese social media and then it became viral. And now it's this trend in which a lot of youth are showing up to work in hoodies and sweats and what's considered obviously like not professional attire. And it's again, just another signal to, you know, the laying flat movement, which obviously was super, super um, viral, like a little while ago, uh, just an addition uh, to that. And a lot of people are saying things like, oh, I just feel like I don't know what I dress up for anymore. I just don't, I just want to live my, I live a uh, live a little of my life like my own way. And so that's one reaction to in like what our, our sort of evolved relationship with work. And in the US, this was from a Substack piece by Emily uh, from Feed Me, a very uh, popular Substack, uh, great, great Substack. She talked about the corporate fetish and how we're basically, you know, fetishizing like the corporate life. Um, and what I found fascinating, you know, was just so when I look at this picture of the Vogue, like picture of like people in this workplace, they look so happy. And it's such a stark contrast to what we used to like the images that I perceive in my mind, at least of like the cubicle, like being this like dark and depressive place. Um, and now we're back to sort of glamorizing this idea of the workplace. And a lot of that I think has to do with what she describes as like an escape. And, you know, the workplace offered us some level of structure and a place where we can like quote unquote perform in some place and then like leave that place and then go back home. But now that our, you know, work lives and personal lives become so blurred together, we almost like, romanticize this idea of like where things used to be separate and it reminded me of like Zach's like talked a lot about this too in like sociology terms like this front stage backstage idea like the um, Goffman's front stage backstage and it makes me wonder do we are we craving more front stage like spaces because we're so digitally online and everything is so interconnected now just interesting yeah yeah it's a really good really good point I mean interpret this in front stage backstage but i totally see that my reaction was like are we witnessing compared china to the u.s here like just uh where they are on the alienation curve like you know chinese it's newer in china and so they're 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 like dealing with like the effects of capitalism where america were like so far past that and where it's like 
we're romanticizing it again. You know, like we we got we we got over the the alienation to an extent, and so now it's like, ooh, let's um let's cosplay in the workplace. That sounds fun. You're saying it's just a phase. <laughs> Maybe I, I, I don't <laughs> you'll know. Get, you'll get like, through it. <laughs> you you could interpret it as like you know, plotting different stages along an alienation curve. No, no, I mean it makes sense. Just I found these very closely. To, uh, Jasmine shared this on uh, in our internal Slack channel that you know. Governor Ron DeSantis' signing bill that bans children under 14 from having social media accounts. At the same time, he also wants to ban alternative meat. Just an interesting extreme from obviously the rest of like America where it's at right now. Um, just thought we'd surface it because yeah, it, it's the the second the social media one. I feel like makes a lot of sense. The alternative meat one, I'm not quite so sure, <laughs> but um, yeah, it, it's it's readily explained. We're not going to have fake meat like that doesn't work. <laughs> Yeah, I think that like, I mean, we've, we've talked about this before, but just how so much of the how the future unfolds is now it comes down to the court system, which was never really designed to put up with, you know, the rate of change and these kind of things. So I think it is such an important precedent to follow. I mean, I do know that with the meat thing, there's a lot of lobbying. There was a, there was a ton of lobbying um, from special interest groups, uh, you know, in the traditional meat industry. And so I, I don't know if it... it will pass. I'd be very, very curious to watch that. It does set a very dangerous precedent for innovation, you know, in terms of like destroying a lot of like value, like quite clear value when there's like, you know, free competition. So it's interesting, but the theme I read in both of these is like a paternalism in, in you know, the mindset of how, you know, a state should be governed and, and, and legalized. So I think that's maybe an interesting variable to follow, you know, as far as like what the laws, you know, the the, the new kind of like landscape of, of uh, laws is just that like, is there a new sense of paternalism arriving? So this is a new extreme that's to our benefit, but it's something that we're going to have to make sense of. So for the first time, a gene edited pig kidney was transplanted into a person, a 62 year old man, and uh, he's actually doing pretty well. Previous transplants of pig organs, um, people only lived about two months afterwards because they're just, they're not our organs aren't compatible with theirs. But because of the gene editing, so what they did is they used CRISPR to make 69 genetic edits to the pig, and now um, it's the pig um, kidney is more genetically viable with our system. So uh, obviously, this is amazing for you know longevity or like living just a better quality of life as we age. They're looking at you know doing hearts next. Um, so I think this is just opens up a huge world of, I mean, innovation for our health. I mean, I think this is the precursor to like 3D organ printing, but it's kind of, you know, the theoretically at some point in the future, you know, you get any ailment, you reach 80 years old and just open up your abdomen and throw a new set of, of you know, of gear in there. Um, like it, it sounds absurd, but you know, at some point in the probably foreseeable future, um, that's a different landscape. And I think this is like one of those major steps to, you know, huge longevity jumps. Yeah, I'm seeing like Aldous Huxley's Brave New World. Like it's not a stretch to have like we already factory farm animals for food consumption. Why would we also not factory farm pigs for organ transplant? Like it's just like it makes so much sense. Well, I think it's also that like these are interim steps of like at some point we'll be able to 3D print them. So the, the interesting analogy coming back to the, the food bill is that for the longest time, I think it was... There was a, a chemical inside of cat intestines or something like that that they used to make all cheese. Um, so it was like there was an animal product that all cheese needed to be, to be produced. And then we found a way to engineer yeast, I think it was, to produce that instead. Now all cheese is made through that process that, you know, so for a long time we relied on animals to have these byproducts and now we don't. So I see it as like an interim step. But the point is, is that like, you know, animal, I mean, obviously like this is this is the way of a lot of technology. Humans are so weird. Like at one point, like they're, I'm going to conjure cheese out of nowhere. Like I'm going to come up with the idea for cheese and I'm going to figure out how to make it. And like, you know what? What if we looked into cat cat's intestine? Then we'll find this thing <laughs> that will enable us to make cheese. Like it just like it, it, cheese shouldn't exist if that's what we had to do. It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> well, I don't know if it was like an accelerant for the you know industrial. Yeah, I think you got to fact check that because I don't know if it's, it's if it, it was it's, that simple. It's, it was it's rennet, yeah. It's a lot of cheese. Some cheese isn't vegetarian because of that, but yeah, the rennet, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but rennet, could you yeah. make cheese without rennet? Yeah. So now there's vegetarian ver versions of rennet. So, but I mean. In the history of cheese, did it always have Reddit in the beginning? I I'm doubt not it. sure. I doubt it. I don't know. Further research is required. 
Yeah. Well, ca- okay. So cows, sheep, and goats is where Rene um, typically comes from. So I, th- I don't know. Like I, I think maybe yeah, maybe it wasn't. Maybe cats, we but- take out that whole <laughs> section because that was a weird digression. It. I don't know how cats got in there. <laughs> my, my, the simple point is just that like animals often are the intermediary till we find more scalable technologies, and this I think is like a perfect example of that in the, in the organ area. But everyone yeah. who listens now is going to think of cat intestine when they go to the cheese counter. Well, we don't, I mean, <laughs> we stopped doing that a long, long time. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Same with like cat urine and perfume and stuff like that. Oh my gosh. This is how misinformation starts. <laughs> you heard it here, folks. You heard it here first, folks. I'm just kidding. We'll get it out. <laughs> So we're also taking our spaces to extremes and what we're, you know, expecting out of them. So Pete Davidson has purchased a Staten Island ferry that will become a traveling hotel, restaurant and bar. And you're thinking, oh, like, that's cool. They're going to, you know, it's going to work. It's going to move. No, they are going to tow it between locations like Miami and New York. Um, So it's going to be an entertainment space. So a giant floating barge of fun, essentially, is what's going to happen here. And but then, this, this this used to exist. We've seen it in old westerns and stuff, right? That, that like they would have these like casinos on riverboats, right? That was yeah, I, yeah. I think it's just interesting that they're you know it's not they're not using a new boat or anything. You know, it's cool that they're like recycling essentially using this old barge that isn't being used anymore. Got to hand it to to Pete. Like, be the change you want to see in the world. Like, if, I, <laughs> if I had his money, I would do this too. But I, I do think that there's something to like, you know, as, as we progress in technology, like a lot of the time there's like these echoes from the part, you know, like we 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 d- rediscover these old modalities. And I think this is absolutely a case of like, oh, that actually was a very popular thing, Jasmine, to your point. Like, you know, and now we get to kind of re- reimagine it, rediscover it. So, um, you know, I think that's a lot of that in, in history uh, as far as, you know, uh, if you're predicting the future, you can kind of look back quite a lot. And then also, um, there is an emerging brand called Pear, which is a physical space. They sell clothes, but at night they're starting to host events. Um, so, you know, DJs, light hors d'oeuvres. So kind of t- turning into a gathering space, which is really smart um, considering, you know, it helps alleviate some of the financial burdens of owning a brick and mortar location. So again, we're just kind of pushing our spaces to extremes and, you know, even good ways and it's kind of just expecting more of them and being more innovative in how we use them. Tangential to this that um, we discovered during the research as well is like there's a recent rise in branded dwelling. So you can live in a Mercedes Benz condo, for instance, that was one of the brands. Um, also luxury brands are buying condos and like, um, you know, enabling you to live that lifestyle. Like actually, so you wonder if you'll see more of that. It's like not in my mind, it's not dissimilar from like a parrot head retirement community. Like mm-hmm. if you're, you know, ready to go all in, you were suddenly able to. That's really interesting. I always wanted somebody to write some sort of paper or like study into how I think this is distinctly American and it's in the suburbs where like every development is announced with like a sign and it has a name and like it has like it's supposed to elicit something, which I don't. I, I, I wonder how that changes the way a city feels. But like we've had branded living spaces all over American suburbs for a long time. The brands just didn't mean anything. I mean, they meant something if you were local, like you knew what the different brands mm-hmm. were and like what it meant if somebody lived there. So I don't I don't feel like it's that big of a jump. But it's interesting that like brands from outside of housing, like, yeah, it's 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 no different than the is it Jimmy Buffett, his whole thing. With well, the, I think that like the the what I read from this is that that it's the it's the simple trend of of brands becoming communities. You know, if you are if your store becomes a an event space, then who's going to show up, right? You you build a community that's associated with your brand and the vibe that you want to create, and you know that extends to housing. I think that like this is absolutely a straight line trajectory as you know brands are forced to become communities essentially one way or another. Um, so I think I I expect that to just keep going for a very very long time. I think that we're at the very beginning of a long, long curve there. So there's this really interesting uh, California-based startup called Sensible Weather. So the application right now is that they provide basically like a weather guarantee for your vacation, your travel experience. So you pay, is it 8 to 12% of the total cost of your vacation, and they could potentially refund it. So say you're going to Disneyland and it rains, like you don't want to go to Disneyland when it's raining, you could get the cost of your trip refunded. So obviously, as climate change becomes more prevalent, um, 
this weather guarantee is kind of kind of help us guarantee the type of experience we're having, which is a new uh, extreme we haven't been used to. And then also, obviously, there's other applications for this as well, not just vacations, but you can kind of think of different industries like, you know, construction, like say you were having, you know, people come in for a build job at a certain day, it's raining, you can't pour concrete or something like that. Um, so, you know, if we're struggling with extreme heat or extreme cold, which we, you know, probably will be dealing with that more often, then um, this is, you know, a good use case and insurance for that. Obviously, like weddings, outdoor venue, outdoor events, that kind of thing, too. Oh, weddings is interesting. Um, this feels like the kind of business that can only exist right now. And when climate change really starts happening, it won't exist anymore because it won't be financially viable the same way. Like yep. insurers aren't even insuring in a lot of states in certain places. Uh, I don't like to talk poorly about any startup, but it does sound like <laughs> they're banking off of people's fears more than anything else. A couple things in the dating world. One of the things that I came across was that there's this company now called Vita Select in which you hire people to swipe through all of your, you know, your matches and then scout choices for you. And it's this new way of like matchmaking that's become super, super popular. And the space has been growing really, really fast and huge. It's expected to, it's estimated to be worth uh, 1.2 to 1.5 billion globally. And 40% of that market is actually in the US, which is also fascinating that 40% of this happening in US Maybe, maybe not, but I thought that number was huge. Um, and, you know, dating apps are, and on the right here, we know that also dating apps are not doing so well. And the whole thing is that millennials have now, you know, married and no longer need those apps. And youth, Gen Z, don't really like them because they want to meet people in person and they, you know, consider like it a quote unquote ick, you know, and per, they again prefer instead meeting in person and uh, either through DMs on Instagram or on Snapchat. Just anywhere outside of these dating apps in particular, they are like looking for um, their significant other. My uh, thesis that does not take a lot of imagination to arrive at uh, is that like when you think about the dating market, it's going to be completely AI driven and completely high touch. Like things like Bumble in the middle are just going to are going to drop away. I wish I, I have been I put this in our Slack and I've been looking for it ever since. I want to remember the name of this brand. It's a new company that. You chat with a bot, it learns you, um, and then everybody does that. And then those bots go chat with each other. And then you receive a digest of that conversation, um, a 10 point digest. And then from there, you can decide if you want to pursue the relationship further. Like that's the extreme opposite end of what Rebecca just pointed out. But I feel like it's going to be tough to be Bumble. It's going to be tough to be Hinge, you know, in 10 years. It's it's quantity or quality kind of play. Like, I, I think I, I would agree with you that, like, it's it's this hollowing out. Um, and I wonder what other industries those rules might apply to as well, you know, where you either get the, the extremely human or the extremely automated. Because um, I can see that in, in a lot of, especially a lot of marketplace type dynamics, uh, you know, that making a lot of sense. I can see yeah. that in consulting. Instead of uh, having to talk to, like, 10 different agencies. Why not just have our AIs talk to each other yeah. and see if like there's something compatible there? I could see that. Yeah, and it's like expressive of the broader thesis that we have that it's actually going to be, you know, we think uh, AI is going to be the province of the rich, but probably not. You know, the rich will be able to pay for human interaction. Um, and, you know, poorer people be um, using AI more. No, I, I think you're dead right on that as well. Like, I mean, I, I, like the stats already on like screen time with kids, for example, is incredibly economically unevenly distributed. And so I think that like um, that's probably that, that might very well be the way that it, this lays out. I think we're making one assumption. It depends on what AI actually ends up doing and how capable it is. If AI does actually end up creating a better human experience and makes us into better and happier humans, I can imagine AI like that costing a premium only for the rich. If it actually creates worse outcomes and is like a dopamine fix or is a stand in for childcare or whatever, um, it's like a cheaper but lesser quality uh, substitution, then yes. So it depends on how AI actually evolves. Like if it if it meets its potential, why wouldn't it be? Uh, you know, the province of the rich. Mm -hmm. I think every technology example we've had in recent history goes in the other direction, but this is the first technology that could actually possibly 
uh, reverse that. I think you're right. I think that like another way of looking at it is like low versus high fidelity experiences, you know, in terms of like this can, you can make a lot of things more efficient, you know, with AI. And so I think it'll, it'll exist on the whole spectrum. But I think in terms of like the total amount of consumption of AI, if, if that's the way to put it, I think will definitely be skewed heavily. Yeah, I think like Jasmine, to your, to your point, I agree. I would expect both to occur at the same time. And here are those um, godly chat bots. This is from the non-obvious newsletter, which is a personal favorite of mine. Um, like, yeah, academics are already using this. They're already using it to study. They're, people are doing research with this in addition to, you know, you can just talk to scripture in a, in a way. Like, and that's a very intimate relationship with like a, a preacher. And like, what does that mean? We kind of, we talked about that. Um, the concern raised here is an interesting one. There's going to be a temptation to make money, to make notoriety, and to gain attention by ascribing some type of revelatory quality to these chatbots. Basically, that's they're saying it's the same thing that televangelists have done, and you know, using this to to self promote myself and to you know, like I can grab the halo quite literally of uh, of godliness by my association with this, or you know, I was I received divine insights from this. It, like it enables individuals to suddenly like be preachers, you know, potentially. What I thought about when I saw this was um, religious interpretation of scripture or non-religious, whatever, like actual like academic study of scripture. Is, and I've only seen it in Christianity. I haven't seen it in other religions to know. Is so layered and can get so deep. There is a company called The Bible Project, these two founders, and I think they're doing quite well. I only know about them because they signed on to our newsletter in the early days, and I always hoped they would reach out to us, but they never did. Um, but I've been watching that company. And... Um, they animate stories of the Bible, but uh, I think one of the founders is actually an academic, and he talks about the academic discourse around, I mean, one passage can have so many layers of interpretive meaning. It's remarkable. And I just, I feel like, I don't know, is there canon for that interpretation? Or are people always building on interpretation? Is AI going to start building on interpretation? I, I don't know what that world looks like, but that's the first thing I thought about. Like, is the interpretation of scripture about to like have a massive explosion or have we kind of basically is what I'm seeing on the Bible project accepted canon and it's basically going to stay like that? Well, I think that's why we have there's I think 14,000 Starbucks in the US and 400,000 churches. So that's why there are so many churches is because of all of those different types of interpretations. So I think that like when we think about the information ecology, it's kind of interesting because you kind of need to codify it a little bit, you know, like how does it evolve? How does it adapt? I, I, I'm looking at this through the lens of like sci-fi and thinking that like, first of all, like, you know, having your AI God is like a fascinating conversation, but like, what if someone hacks it? What if your AI God tells you who to vote for? You know, like what, if, like there are all these interesting layers and, you know, in, like unintended consequences. I would argue those things already exist in the church anyways. Why? It's they already do, been my, hacked. And they're already telling you who to vote for. So I don't know like it, how, how much it changes things. I'm not even trying to be funny. Like it's, it's as long as religion is interpreted by a human, there's a bias there that's being encoded into people. I, I totally get that. It's more just that like it, it, it becomes much more black and white when AI does it as opposed to when a human does. You know, if, if, if there's like if you find in the, in the training set like explicit instructions for voting, for example, like is that, you know, like um, is there is there a legal line or a differential that we create around that or does that not matter at all? I think that like. Yeah, I mean, either way, this is like just a deeply fascinating like phenomenon to watch. All right. Kids are the front line of our cultural anxieties. This has been true forever. Um, when women were going to go into the workplace, oh, my God, what's going to happen to the kids if they do that? Um, when we were going to, you know, debating still if we were going to allow gay people to be married. What kind of example are there, is this going to set for children? Trans is the same thing. Like, that's the discourse now. But like, this is a particular new evolution of what we're going to get into here, a really tech based and AI based fear with kids, the front, like that's where the rubber meets the road with a lot of the fears mm. for people. It's like <gasps> the children. This first one I came across, like ignore the ignore the um, dystopian tone. What he's saying is still interesting. There are suddenly all over YouTube, people realize this is a very easy thing to monetize. It's very easy to make AI videos for children because um, they're animated and kids watch something over and over and over and over. And here this person is bragging about how they made $1.2 million with kids videos. This uh, author watched a bunch of these and 
like was pretty horrified by the results. Like they, it was like not very realistic at all, filled with all kinds of weird jumps that like they it was loosely about, you know, names of shapes, but like that didn't last very long. And then it devolved into this weird thing that was like made no sense. And so, um, you know, kids brains are just soaking this stuff up and really for the first time in history. Obviously, th this will get corrected. There will be very good. Um, you know, very well researched, very beneficial AI for kids, but there's also going to be this too. And it's, it's, you know, it's interesting because it's like, you know, so easy to monetize this. It's so easy to like, you know, to be a creator, broader implications for like creators beyond kids too. Five years ago when I had my twins, this stuff existed. I don't know if it was AI generated, but super low quality, choppy, random like inhuman content that would go on for hours. The only reason I found them is because if I was, if my child was like, you know, teething or something, I need to distract them so that they would calm down for a little bit and I could give them medicine or whatever. Um, they, you find them because they have millions and millions of views. So they were already super popular before AI yeah. and obviously it's going to proliferate, but I always thought that was weird and I didn't get it. And I don't know if parents just didn't watch it, but some of this stuff is so weird and yeah. just like, it's a really weird thing to give a little child's brain when that's when they're developing their model of the world. I think that like the 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 broader this is a broader symptom of just like obviously AI in general, but I think the 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 way we need to look at this is that we are about to flood every content channel with a near infinite supply of incredibly low quality content. And that changes the way in which you have to navigate these things, right? Because now, like, we, we, we need to, like, it, it's much harder to find maybe the, the high quality content. And so, like, I think that the way in which we've used algorithms and things has to evolve. But, like, I think the, the broader principle here is that, like, imagine you 10x the entire content availability of the internet but it was all low quality content. Now, like it's, you're looking for, it's a bit more of like a needle in a haystack situation. Um, so it's just, it's a different information ecology, I think that, that we're arriving at here. And this is like the, the most visible format of it. Yeah, this author pointed out, if you're a parent, you don't watch these, you see, oh, this has got 36 million views. It must be good. And then you, <laughs> yeah. and then you move on. Yeah. With all of that, and the videos we just talked about, um, apparently kids' cartoons are getting a free pass from YouTube's deep fake disclosure rules. So essentially, if you're using AI, you know, synthetic media, you have to let viewers know what, that what they're seeing isn't real. Um, so they're excluding animated content from that altogether because they're saying, oh, like nobody, you know, thinks it's real. So therefore, we don't need to put, you know, this disclosure that it's not real. But essentially then, like we just talked about, those videos kind of keep just getting churned out and they're aimed at children, um, but they're not having to disclose their methods. So like you said, they could start out, you know, one way talking about shapes, colors, but then they kind of um, devolve um, into these weird messages or weird things. So um, yeah, there's there's something we're going to, you know, this is probably going to evolve. People aren't going to like, you know, them not regulating this, but something probably needs to be done. We have to talk about this. This is the biggest news of the week, kind of. Uh, Jonathan Haidt's new book, The Anxious Generation, friend of the pod, comes up every time. Um, I grabbed Greg Eisenberg here. Uh, Jasmine, I think you shared this on LinkedIn. He's really confident that this movement, anti-smartphone movement, is going to be a success. And I, I agree. I mean, the groundswell is there. Like the consciousness is consciousness has been raised. I mean, think back to that documentary from five years ago, like the so social network or I don't know you know what I'm talking about the Netflix one that was really the first yeah, move and, in this direction and also supersize me also before that remember supersize me where the guy would supersize his meals at every fast food place remember at McDonald's you sure Zach, so you're you the, same, the same effect on that had yeah the same it just like on, yeah, yeah that one piece of content raised our like cultural awareness around something and changed our behaviors it's like a tent pole moment yeah yeah I mean how do we see this how do we see this uh, playing out like uh, on like how if we were to predict how long will this take? What actually will happen? You know, we've like we've already said that like, you know, DeSantis is trying to ban smartphones for people under 14 or social media for people under 14 in Florida. Is that how this is gonna go down? Like, are you not gonna be able to buy an iPhone until you have a certain age? But you know, like things like like seriously, like how how will I can this see. happen? So well, usually legislation does some legislation does happen around movements like these. Um, it puts pressure um uh, when you have something like this and it's a movement with a name and a body of research, then people can start like actually creating laws and they can start creating um, uh, pressure in communities. And it usually happens from the ground up. It's not top down. Yeah. Um, what's interesting about this one is um, just how 
intelligently branded it is. As I've been talking about this with um, other moms in the suburb that I live in, I think it's easy to forget we are exposed to the narrative around technology all the time. So this seems so obvious to us by this point. Like, it's done. I've heard this story. I already know my kids aren't going to get phones until they're 16. Like, that was something I decided years ago. But this is actually not, like, before now or what it's about to happen, it's actually not, like, mainstream knowledge. And it's not something that people – people generally have some knowledge, but I don't think that people know that, like, there is actual science. Because what he's presenting – I haven't read the book, but – I read his articles and what he's presenting, I believe, is like actual numbers, figures, dates that you should do the cutoff, consequences for what happens when you don't. And I think it's forcing, we talked about this in our community exposure therapy, like I really want to see, this is the first time I'm going to see a branded piece of content turn into a movement. I've always seen those things in hindsight, but now I get to watch it in real time now. And I'm, I want to learn from what he's doing. The first thing I can see that he's doing is he's drawing a very clear line in the sand about the the which side of morality you're on this is not a logical argument although there's a lot of logic there it's a very much a moral panic based argument i'm not saying that it doesn't deserve to have panic around it but like he's really heightening your emotions around this and he's really making it clear that good people do it this way bad people do it that way i i think my there's there's two thoughts that i have here one because he in his in his piece he writes about how like we don't just need to take away phones, but we also need to replace it with something. And I think that the challenge is that like, you know, um, you can get rid of that, but what are you putting in its place? And that's the other side of that to make the solution viable. Um, you know, I think it comes down to community. And I think what's kind of amazing, if, if you imagine a world in which no kid has a smartphone before 16, how fundamentally different is that childhood to the generation before? Like this will create such a profound generational divide where one generation grew up on a stage and the other didn't one generation grew up in public and the other didn't like i i don't know if there will is a single other type of technology that could even theoretically create a more different experience of a childhood and so there's a lot of like you know how does this play out but i'm just thinking that like there is going to be a a hard line in the difference of experience here he points out the other part of his argument is that like at the same time as we move to phone based, we no longer play together. Children no longer play together yeah. outside the supervision of adults, which is like, that's what my childhood was like. I would yeah. just run around the town and then I would come home at a time. And like that's used to be how it was done. And that was like Height argues that's essential for, you know, proper development and socialization. And, and that's been taken away. And it's hard to bring that back in a fear based culture. Like, mm-hmm. you know, because we there's so much. So like that is the prime candidate to take its place. But like, yeah. will we have that means that we have to overcome our culture of fear. And that seems really, really difficult in a climate that we have right now. So like it's a super fascinating question of like what's going to fill the the place. And I I'm a little bit nervous. Like, yes, we're fighting this phone based battle right as Apple's launching the Vision Pro. Like <laughs> we're about to get the next yeah. based existence. You know, like they're doing it again. It's happening again. And. I have to imagine that the groundwork laid for this will obviously trickle over into all interaction with any technology whatsoever. Um, but still, it's like, yep, Apple's moving on. The society's moving on. They're laying the groundwork for like our next blank-based existence that's going to be in a headset. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I I think this is like the conversation to have, and I think you're dead right. And that like we know that like gaming is the primary mode of socialization for kids. So like we we already know that like you know if it's not social media, it's gaming. Like they're they're in these spaces. I think one of the big challenges here is that like so much of how like the the American parenting experience is like the physical infrastructure. Just the simple notion that parks are in separate places to commercial spaces. So, you know, I, there's no serendipity because I have to go to a park at a certain time. So I don't accidentally bump into people because no one's accidentally at the park and there's no, it's not a place that I'm going through to get somewhere. So like, we've lost that. Everything has to be planned. And like, so much of our physical infrastructure has created that experience. And to, to your point about like the anxiety generation around parenting, like we built, we poured that with concrete. So how do you change the parenting experience without changing the urban environment and that is not a quick or cheap thing to do and so yeah in my mind it's like this is like it's such a tectonic shift and i don't I, we don't know we're gonna wait and we're gonna have to find out but that i think it's gonna be hamstrung i think in a large we don't realize it but by our, our urban environments i will say this though 
I what I like about this movement is that typically um, stuff like this still puts the onus on the parent. Like you're a bad parent if you don't do this. But because it looks like this is going to translate into like actual laws and he's advocating for that kind of stuff, it stops making it a moral imperative for the parent and actually encodes it into our legal structures. And I, I think that usually movements stop short of that. And I like that this is jumping that gap and it might actually lead to something so that, um, you know, I understand that it looks and feels like taking away people's rights, but I feel like this is the kind of America that we romanticize, an America that used to protect its citizens, that protected its people. That's why I think RFK is so popular right now because he's talking about like food safety and chemicals in our food. Like he's talking about like this idea of like servant uh, servant leadership, you know, being a public servant and actually catering to the people. And I feel like there's a bit of that in this too that I think is drawing people to it. Yeah, great point. Well, I, I think just maybe a last thought on this is just that like one of the things that strikes me is that like we, you know, we tend to kind of capitalize all of these things. And like, if you look at where do kids spend time that's not in digital environments, it's with like, you know, the expensive activities parents do, you know, take them to ballet class or violin or dance class or hockey or soccer, or whatever it is. But like, there are all these like regimented activities. And I, the, the big, big, big question for me that, that remains unanswered is that like, what do we replace all that time they would have spent on the phone with? And is it by necessity going to be a paid for experience you know are we going to capitalize that or are we going to allow that to be you know go play in the woods because i don't think we will so that i think is like the is there a new institution or not even an institution but like what what is the infrastructure that supports a child free uh, a phone free childhood um that, that we can provide uh, that i think is is the, like the essential question that this this raises okay well this dovetails with the whole we've been talking about communes so much in our slack and in the exposure therapy slack like there's such a movement towards these uh, collective living arrangements or co-living. Yeah. And that's what it used to be, right? It was the street. It was like the street in front of your house. Um, so I could see this. They're, you know, they're, they're sister movements. The commune thing, I don't I don't know how much steam that's going to get. Although people like it's it's more than before. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you're right. It, it keeps hitting what Zach says, this uh, fear based um, mentality that yeah. millennials have. Yeah. But change has to start somewhere. And Oh, no, no. I mean, I think yeah. this is the trajectory. I think it's just that, like, what you quickly realize is that, like, every, like the, the, what we're talking about is everything is built in concrete. And so someone has to demolish it and build something new. And, like, again, it's just that, like, that's that's the friction here. Um, that, like, to build a commune, you have to take some land and build something. And I think as desirable as that is, that's not accessible. Yeah, I just wanted to add, like, this whole, even with you know, the whole ban around like TikTok, for example, um, and social media is one of the biggest reasons why kids use phones is really just for that. Yeah. Um, and if we take away phones, like that's a huge, you know, take away social media to inevitably. And like, obviously with the whole Ron DeSantis thing that all like kind of make, make sense. And my thing was that, yeah, like you said, John, just to add to that, like you're taking away such a huge part of their regular day and what is going to fill that gap. I can imagine um, a huge loss, like a feeling of loss from like a child's point of view and feeling like, oh my God, like, what do I do now? Like, who am I without like social media? And that being like a huge like thing to overcome. Because um, mm -hmm. there was this Wall Street, uh, Wall Street Journal article about the, you know, the senators having to sort of basically fight with their kids about this whole TikTok yeah, situation. Because that's how a crack addict talks, like yeah. they're addicted. I don't, I, so you said that before, and I think it's a really excellent point. I just, I don't know if it's going to be the trauma that we think it might be. Kids adapt and like, you know, they're moving from an unhealthier habit to hopefully a healthier habit. Now, as far as like, where are these kids going to go? Well, they're somewhere when they're on their phones. So it's not like they're like effectively spaceless. Like they're either going to be at home or they're going to be at school. Um, maybe they'll start going to the mall again. Maybe we'll see a resurgence of malls and the mall rat. But like, Maybe we're overestimating the catastrophe that happens after you take away their phones. Like, it's not like they're completely like, there's just no space for them to occupy anymore. And they don't need to be like in an expensive camp or wherever. Um, they can be bored like we were when we were kids well, and just figure it out. Like, I didn't have camp or anything. I just had to figure out how to have a good time. Yeah. So much of my time was spent like doing random stuff around the house, you know. 
Well, I think the I know challenge... how I sound to people who are probably going to be watching this. But <laughs> anyways, go ahead. I, I just see it as like the, the what is the, what is what are the needs that social media functionally provides, and I think a large part of that is it fulfills a lot of those social needs, that sense of community. Well, and those that's pieces. okay, but that's what I'm that's saying. That's the question. It's it's not really fulfilling those needs. No, but it's, it's, wanna, it's addressing that. And this but. is the thing: if you want to fulfill those needs, it's ta- it's going to take work. It's social media is easy, and it's um, what is it? Um, when you have a one-way relationship, what is it called? Parasocial. Parasocial relationship. So it's not even like a real relationship. So maybe kids are going to have to learn, and parents too, how to like actually be in the real world. Well, that's the I point. Would, it's just, yeah. yeah, how do we build the infrastructure for that? Go ahead. That's what I was going to say. There's probably going to be a bunch of industries that pop up around like teaching us actually how to kind of like re-interact with each other, be in the world, like filling your time in a in a good way of, you know, how do you be in community with people? Because I think not even just kids need to relearn that, but like people yeah. do too, adults. You can't underestimate, again, though, like that AI is colliding with this. Like no, the runway yeah. right now boo, is ramping up on generative AI world building. So that's where we're going to go. Like it's obvious that's where we're like. And yeah. so so, like we're kicking the can down the road on the battle ultimately and like i'm just thinking like if i'm a parent like because i am a parent actually i don't have to think about it uh like okay i can't murphy can't have a cell phone until he's 16 but he's gonna start going places like at 12 like like that's why parents yeah. get them phones so they can text them and they can track their location they know where they are so parents are still going to get their kids phones for that reason and break the law and like there's going to be nothing to stop those kids from having like social media apps on them and yeah it's just it's a hard it's a hard thing it's a very very hard thing yeah, I just had a total, like, I just totally remember this thing that I read a long time ago, I think. Um, and we talked about it to be like years ago. And it was about like how, yeah, kids started getting phones after 9-11. And like, how like, because of that, you know, parents yep. just needed to know all the time where their yeah. kids were. And that being such yeah. a huge yeah. part of like, why we give kids yeah. phones so young, which makes so much yeah. sense. Well, maybe... Maybe we'll see a surge in dumb phones, like a, the dumb phone industry. I'll have parents buy dumb phones for their kids. I, I, I think we will. But I think, you know, you come back to this really simple point. Like there was an invisibility episode I listened to forever ago about a, a, a blind kid who learned to echolocate. And a huge part of that is that someone needed to give them the margin of error to fall over and hurt themselves. And there was a lot of blind kids who were never given the opportunity to fail, you know, so everyone was always guiding them. So they never had the opportunity to have that sense of independence. And it just makes me think about our risk tolerance. You know, in terms of like, we have such a low risk tolerance that, you know, we don't let kids fail. We don't let them struggle. We don't let, you know, like we, we've taken away those opportunities um, for risk. And I think that's such a part of that, you know, foundational experience that like, um, that's that's what we're talking about, right? Is that the risk aversion, the anxiety is, is, the, is the issue with even the concept of building a kid centered space. So like, I, I think that that's the essential issue that we have is like, are we do we have too much anxiety to even concept a, a building or an environment for them anymore? Yeah, I mean, we have to solve all the problems at once. We have to stop mass shootings, like have to like have to make the public less scary, have to solve disease, have to like restore uh, social capital, have to fix communities, have to fix third spaces, have to have livable cities. Like all of these <laughs> things have to happen, you know, to really eliminate that anxiety and heal society. And yeah. I think we're going to do that digitally. Like, I really, I really, really, really do think that, like, that will happen there and we'll be in homes. But, you know, we'll see. Mm-hmm. I could mm-hmm. be wrong. This is just a small point, but I thought it's definitely significant to this conversation. Ryan's World, famous, popular YouTube channel, especially for kids. I mean, mostly for kids or for kids entirely. Um is making a movie now and it's entirely without the help of Hollywood whatsoever. And he's to be able to do this all without the, yeah, with any kind of major studio, which is huge. And we're talking about getting rid of social media and phones, but Ryan's world is literally a product of kids being on social media all the time. So it's just an interesting signal in part of, as part of this conversation. One bold solution to the problem of smartphones is just to eliminate all the kids. If we don't have any kids, we don't have this problem. And that seems what we're hell bent on doing. Uh, just this billboard is shocking. Like, I get, I mean, I can connect with the, again, the culture, like basically this article about antinatalism is like, it just depends on if you have an optimistic view of the future or a negative view of the future. If you have a negative view of the future, it's like kids are bad. It's Im- immoral to like bring kids into this world. And like, we're going to put it on a billboard. Like, you know, it's pretty shocking that this is something you're driving down the highway. And instead of like an abortion billboard, you're seeing something like this. And, you know, like this, uh, Los Angeles times, um, thing that Rebecca sh- found, like, are these kids already doomed? You know, millennials maybe have already ruined children. And he's like, I'm I'm fascinated by the birth rates conversation because like 
there's an entry point for everybody into that. It's such a moral gray. Like everybody's got an opinion on like declining birth rates and what that means, if it's good or bad. Um, you know, the, on the far right or I mean, on the far side, it's like, yeah, this is great because the planet needs it. Like, let's get rid of the humans. On the other side, this is horrible. It's for all, all these other reasons. And the um, the study there in 2100, basically by current projections, 78 percent of babies are going to be born in what is now like the developing world. And like so that's where the humans are going to go. And that's where like um, climate change is going to be the worst, sadly. And so it's like we're setting up for maximal human misery, actually, you know, putting people in like the places that are going to be very hard to live in and like the places that are easier to live in, we're eliminating the people. So, you know, just this is this is a parallel conversation that is going to be unavoidable in the future. Yeah, yeah. I, I think this all comes down to information ecology, just the way it, like I, I honestly, if social media didn't exist um, and if we if we didn't have an advertising based news system, like I really wonder if we would be able to have a narrative like this, because objectively, it's the safest time it's ever been <laughs> to have kids like the, the, the be, be, best off they've ever been, you know, by almost every measure we're doing great. And I think it's just like it's amazing that the sort of denial of the the, the facts here um, that this requires um, it's but it, it's an absolute artifact of the anxiety um, uh, arena here. Just a couple of last things that didn't quite slot into a um, theme, but were still worthwhile to share that we'll go through uh, quickly here by way of ending. I came across this Business Insider article talking about how why investors think Reddit is worth $1 billion more than the New York Times, which is pretty huge. Uh, Reddit, you know, it's, which loses money is currently worth around 8.15. New York Times, which makes money, is worth about 7.2. And a large factor to that is just the fact that Reddit's business model depends on free content from its users. And so therefore it's deemed as much more valuable because it's, you know, it's a lot cheaper, obviously, because now, because the New York Times has, is sustaining itself by like through, you know, paid subscriptions and things like that. Um, and, you know, Reddit's pitch is that its flow of free content will always be there and that it will always get better by, uh, get it better at selling ads. And therefore, you know, pitch, pitch investors are very like attracted to that. This was a thought experiment that I posed to our community in exposure therapy. If you look on the right, these were the most affluent metropolitan areas in 1949, and they are the Rust Belt. I mean, obviously, this is tied to, to manufacturing. And um, what would it take to flip this again? Like, it's, you know, obviously, climate change is a big, big deal. A new invention is a big deal. But it's just shocking to see how different it was not so long ago. Um, and on the left, the mean distance um, to the employer has risen 170% in the last uh, four years. Obviously, the pandemic, obviously remote work, but it's just worth noting that it's clustered in the young and how this will impact what happens on the right, you know, in the future. It's like I see just more disper like less agglomeration, more dispersion, most likely. And so, you, like, you know, there'll be pockets of wealth and mixing everywhere. So I came across this in ad week and essentially it was talking about how brands need to start preparing for super fans. So as people are getting younger, so as you can see here, Gen Z uh, millennials, we're starting to really, you know, these indicators of self with these communities like church, religion, we're just un not able to, you know, have our identities form around them as much. So we're choosing other things. So we're choosing, um, you know, Mu uh, favorite musical artists, movie franchises, video games. So um, on the top, there's percentage of consumers who say their fandom for the following is important to their identity. Uh, Gen Z, 58%. Uh, they're a musical artist. Millennials, interesting enough, say the brands um, are a strong reflection of who they are. Um, so just, you know, anything that you're doing with your brand or that your brand is could potentially formed into an identity or has the potential, especially for younger generations. And the quintessential identity play, bookstores, independent bookstores. I shared this because they, as it says there on the left, that they've broken the rules of the free market for the first time in history. People are willingly paying more for something that they can, the exact same thing that they can get elsewhere, cheaper, more conveniently, and faster. Why are they doing that? Well, that's because books are this rare thing that we all know is a status symbol. And I like to like say that I support my local bookstore. I keep it in business. Like, I just shared this because like, is there another category like this? Like they say this doesn't work anywhere else. Like Costco arrives, like local butchers go out of business. Like we really, well, we readily pay for lesser quality. Like, I mean, like we readily, you know, go cheap whenever we can in most cases. And it's a status signal obviously to go up. But like where else might we see this? I, I think maybe this article misunderstands why people buy in bookstores. I don't know the last time you've been in a bookstore, but like 
it's not the way it used to be. Going into a bookstore, like, that's my favorite place to go with the kids. And we go there, like, for fun, for recreation. You can go sit and read books. There's a Starbucks there. They sell gifts and tchotchkes. The people are nice. You can talk to them. Like, we run into some of our neighbors sometimes. It's a lot of independent bookstores have become community hubs. Um, and, of course, you're going to buy books there because, um, you know, I could – for me personally, I could see like a novel online, but when I'm holding it, I can read a couple of pages. I'm already in a good mood, maybe like a bit of a sugar high. I'm going to buy it because it's like a it's like a memento from the day. And I, by the way, I'm not even talking like we don't have a neighborhood bookstore. We go to Barnes and Noble and the Barnes and Noble here is like such a fun space. I love going there. It's better than our library because our library, I don't know, we live in a nice neighborhood. For some reason, the libraries don't even have books on the shelves anymore. I went to my childhood library recently. The There are like at least 30% less shelves than there used to be. Um, you can't talk. I mean, I still love libraries. It's like one of my place, favorite places to go to to read books uh, or to, to do work rather, especially libraries that were like built in the 80s. Um, and even libraries now, like they've added more like, you know, community programming and things like that. But um, some bookstores have become so niche and have so much community programming and so much other stuff that you can do there. It's just a really well-branded space like we were talking about earlier. So I don't know. I feel like this author needs to go into a bookstore because I, I think don't think it's about a cheaper product. You're, well, you're these are exactly like community right. membership tokens. That's what they functionally are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tellingly, um, I found this linked in Rob Henderson's newsletter. So, of course, he would surface an article that emphasizes the status of book buying versus like <laughs> what you're pointing out, which is like so true. The experience. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome, guys. That was a fantastic presentation. This was a, a really interesting month. Lots of um, insights and good discussion. Thank you so much. And we'll see everybody next time.